Let's get some analysis on the situation. We're joined by Renaud Foucault, senior lecturer in economics at the University of Lancaster, right up there in the uh, northwest uh, of England, a region I know and love so well. Good evening to you, sir. Thanks to see you. Uh, yet again, we're talking about Macron and these reforms, and I think we'll be doing this for some time to come. Um, he's defending his actions um, almost as sternly as the unions detest them. In your view, who's right? Uh, I think um, Emmanuel Macron is right in one way, in the sense that uh, he believes he had to do it and that the only way he could find a majority in parliament to do it would have been to go to the right. And the unions, I think, are right when they say that they were open to compromise, but not on that reform. So, again, you need to think about Macron 2017. The first version of Emmanuel Macron was going through a reform that was a point-based reform that would have treated everyone the same based on the number of years they work as compared to what it is this time. So what it is this time, the reason why it was so unacceptable for the union is largely that it was really treated better people who started to work late, so typically people who are better off, who went to university, but also people with a longer life expectancy than people who start younger. So in that sense, I think the unions are somehow in their right to say that they were more open to that. But I think Macron is in his right to say that there was not necessarily a political path for such a reform. So who would have voted with Emmanuel Macron a reform today that would have been like the 2017 reform. Definitely not the left and most likely not the right. So I think it's really a political impasse at the moment. There are three blocs in France, one third on the left and far left, one third on the right and far right, and Macron in the middle, and a complete inability to make compromise in parliament and to build coalitions. It sounds to me, and correct me if I'm wrong, and I'm sure you will, Renaud, it sounds to me that what you're saying is this breaks down to a policy that is good if you're rich or you have money and not so good if you're poorer and you've got to work to feed right, yourself. That that's that's the I think the, the main driver behind the, the the anger towards that reform is that by moving the minimum pension age you're increasing the number of years that someone who started early has to work but you're not changing somebody like me who started to work later because went to university would already retire at 65 in France so that's the main reason why I think a lot of people are angry but it's also something you cannot entirely blame on Emmanuel Macron because that was not an initial plan his initial plan was not to do that. It was to have a point-based reform. It's just the only political path he thought he had. But actually, it failed, because he made all those concessions that were control c control v cut and paste from the program of Les Républicains, the conservative right. And in the end, half of them decided that it was too unpopular, and they would not vote it. So he, he actually completely failed to build any kind of coalition, even on something that was actually the program of somebody else. So he hasn't played the political game well enough. You mentioned this thing about people who have been able to retire early and now have to work longer. I mean, I'm looking at your face, sir, as you talk, and it's very clear you love your job and you'd probably work for as long as you possibly can. I, I, I sense that's the case. You might correct me if I'm wrong, of course. But do you think there are some people who genuinely have a case to hold on to these pension rights that are kind of specific to France that allow them to retire early? Well, the way I think the system is thought about in France, you need to think about a country that has a bigger public sector than most. So it makes a lot of sense to think when you are in a country with 50% of public sector, to think about the kind of uh, fairness and redistribution you can make, including in time. So one good reason why you want to do that is that life expectancy is not the same for everyone. So if you have people who are actually expected to only work, uh, to only retire for a few years because their job is more complicated, and that's the kind of thing that the previous reform, the one under François Hollande, was taking into account. There was the idea that you have different a uh, number of years to work, depending on whether you do a job that is very heavy, like if you are a cashier in a supermarket or if you work carrying heavy loads, you need to work less. Those kind of things were also part of the idea that could have entered a deal with the unions. Uh, is it that Macron failed to find that kind of deal because he couldn't work with the left? Is it that the left refused? I don't know. But in the end, this is what Emmanuel Macron was talking about five years ago, and this has completely disappeared from the conversation now. The strikers in the UK, where you are, yes, <laughs> they could have taken, I'm thinking about the RMT union right now, they could have taken 5% before Christmas, and they were criticised for not taking 5%. I understand that they've now got something like 14 15% as a pay rise. I mean, they're showing that striking works. Do you think the French, the eight main French unions, will take a kind of lead from that and keep going? 
and keep pushing. Well, last time in 2017, strikes worked. Macron had also the reform through Parliament to 49 countries, but then in the end, also because there was COVID, of course, he withdrew the reform. I don't think it will happen this time because Macron doesn't want to be re-elected. Even his political party, there is no real like big political movement behind Emmanuel Macron. It's all about him and he's alone and he cannot be re-elected. So in that sense, I think somehow the success of the strikes of 2017 have led have created the path for this reform that I think in the eyes of many observers is, uh, say, to say the least, much less subtle and much less fine-tuned than what could have been achieved before. So, uh, yes, of course, you can always uh, influence decision by going in the street. And I'm pretty sure that at some point, if there are millions of people in the street, Macron will be sitting down and trying to make some concessions. But on the main principle of that reform, unless there was uh, some sudden willingness from him to uh, dissolve parliament and try to get a new majority or something like that, I don't expect anything this time, no. Renaud, you mentioned that his movement's all about him, his performance in his interview at lunchtime on France 2, which the international audience uh, would not see. They've seen a couple of snippets. I don't know whether you got to see it all, but I watched it from start yeah. to finish. And he handles these situations amazingly well. He's an extremely good TV performer. He handles the interview very well. He seems to be like the master of the universe in that situation. That said, would you think or would you agree that the use of 49.3, as it has been happening with an amount of regularity, it has to be said, this special decree-like clause within the Constitution, to push something through without a vote, that's a, is that a tactical error, do you think? Was it a mistake by Macron to go for that? I think he really had no choice this time. I mean, no choice given that he wanted to get the reform through. Uh, in the end, because I think there's a tradition in France that you are used to have a majority, you are used to have the government who can actually dictate to parliament, and parliament is much less powerful than in other countries in France. Suddenly, this time, there was this idea of maybe let's try something different because there is no majority in parliament. Let's see if we can do something by uh, making concessions to another party. And so I think that's really why he tried to push up to the last minute to have a vote with the support of Les Républicains. But at the end, the 49.3 is somehow very standard French democratic processes. It's been used a hundred times. What makes it different this time is that it's done by a government that doesn't have a majority in parliament. So uh, he won the vote of no confidence. So the process is democratic, but we are very, very short in terms of votes. There are like nine, 10 votes. Uh, soon there will be new contentious uh, laws coming. So the laws about migration, some of it is designed to be supported by the left. Some of it is designed to be supported by the right. Those are coalitions that could be built and that could go through parliament, but it can also get to, at some point, um, one vote of a no confidence that go through. It's possible. Renaud, thank you very much indeed for sharing your analysis with us. Renaud Foucault, senior lecturer in economics, uh, but expert in so much more as we heard from our interview. <laughs> Wide ranging it was indeed. Thank you, sir, for being patient with me because my questions went off off the map a little bit for you, but you uh, gave us a very good uh, answer to each of them. Uh, as always, uh, Rono Foucault is a lecturer in economics at Lancaster University up there in the northwest of England. Thank you, Rono, for joining us. Great to see you. Thank you.